fellow Falcoholics. What is up? Welcome to week two of the Falcoholic Podcast Falcons film review. This week, a little bit of a more positive tenor. Although the Falcons didn't come away with the victory against the Los Angeles Rams in week two, they did put together a heroic comeback uh, effort, which is nice uh, to see that instead of the Falcons being on the receiving end of that heroic effort and still losing. Uh, Of course, the comeback did ultimately fall short. Uh, There were a lot of reasons for that mostly early in the game obviously only scoring three points you know for much of the game falling down 28 to 3 that sort of thing those are a lot of the reasons they lost the game not necessarily any of the magic wearing off late or anything like that um it's it was a very odd game for the falcons they they did not play like I'm used to seeing them playing on defense. They definitely switched a lot of stuff up this week to very poor results, especially early on. Um, But we'll get into that. I have a number of plays we can break down uh, from early in the game, also from late in the game. Um, Some stuff we're going to cover here uh, before we get into that. But uh, before we do that, guys, just really appreciate everyone watching. If you're watching On YouTube, you're going to be able to see all the clips. If you're listening on the audio, I will try to notate uh, the the num like the the clock when the play starts. You can go find the clips yourself if you want. Um, Try to describe it as well as I can, but you can always also watch it on our YouTube page after you're done listening to the podcast if you want to see those exact plays. Um, But yeah, we really uh, appreciate everyone for tuning in. Like, subscribe. Uh, You can check us out on Patreon if you want early access to all these podcasts. You'll get them the night before on the Patreon page. Um, So you can check that out. It's patreon.com slash falcoholiclive. Yeah, let's get right into my notes from this game. Um, The biggest one is that this team was, the Falcons were just really, really sloppy to open this game. I mean, they looked like the team traveling to... Uh, all the way across the country against the team that had extra rest and was playing at home. Um, so that was pretty much on brand for what you'd expect uh, in that scenario. They were super duper sloppy on that opening drive. They had that false start on a crucial third down that ended up making it third and 11. Then they blew uh, the protection call on a pretty obvious blitz that led to Bobby Wagner's sack. Then, of course, we had the missed field goal from Youngway Koo on that same drive. On the very next drive, we had a snap just hit Kyle Pitts, and they lost a lot of yardage on that. Um, just very sloppy, very poor play to open the game. You know, I think that's first script to drive. The play selection wasn't bad or anything like that. It's just that it was not well executed. Um, sticking with the offense, uh, the Falcons wanted to continue running the ball. They activated an extra running back. Damian Williams went on IR before this game. So they activated, of course, rookie Tyler Algier. They also had uh, Caleb Huntley elevated from the practice squad. They clearly wanted to run the ball in this game. They did not do a great job of that at all. They were actually pretty awful on in short yardage situations. I, I had them at one of three on third and short. Uh, and of course, Owen, Owen one on fourth and short running. Um, just constant mistakes in the red zone on offense. Uh, they had a false start on that first on their first red zone series. Then they had a holding uh, call on the next red zone series, and they had an illegal shift on the red zone series after that. As you guys know, none of those ended up resulting in touchdowns. Um, I thought the run blocking was quite poor. I thought that the running backs basically had very little chance to get out of the backfield. Those big holes they had against the Saints were not there. Um, and the running game as a whole struggled. Every running back struggled. Patterson made a couple plays happen by just being Quirrell Patterson and sort of making making it work. Uh, he still averaged over four yards a carry, but everybody else was was really struggling. Um, so that wasn't great. Um, the pass blocking I thought was okay. It was certainly not as, as good as it was against the Saints. Um, a lot of it had to do with missed missed protection calls on blitzes and things like that uh Mariota did have to deal with a lot more pressure sacked three times in this one compared to zero sacks and one hit last week so hopefully this is just a you know the case of going up against a very a very good Rams you know front obviously uh Aaron Donald's amazing Leonard Floyd ended up being healthy enough to play in this one and he was effective um you know Ashawn Robinson and Greg Gaines are two good starters as well they have pieces there. They don't necessarily have a lot of depth, but um, the Falcons didn't really make them test their depth because the Rams were able to play with a huge lead for basically the entire game. Um, outside of that, I know everyone's really upset about the lack of Pitt's targets, and I get it. Um, 
you know, to be clear, um, Pitts was getting a lot of attention, as you might expect. The flip side of that is that the Falcons finally do have someone to take advantage of Pitts getting all the attention, and that person is Drake London, who is everything you we have hoped for. Like to to be clear, Drake London is it. Like he is the Falcons wide receiver one. Uh, he's been as advertised as as we hoped. Uh, great hands, completely fearless. Uh, great contested catch guy. Great at getting himself open. Very good after the catch. We saw him hurdle someone. Um, Drake London is good, and that is a very positive takeaway from these first two games is that the Falcons finally do now have someone to punish teams for really selling out to stop pits. They can't just sell out to stop pits, and then the Falcons have nothing else. They do have Drake London. Dude also want to shout out Kadero Hodge, uh, who has sort of become the wide receiver three for this team. Um, surprisingly, you know, Lamade Zacchaeus is probably the number two. Hodge, though, has been the three. Uh, he's played more than Brian Edwards. He's caught more passes than Brian Edwards. He's Caught more passes than Kyle Pitts, maybe. I don't know if he's actually caught more, but he has more yards. Um, so good on Kadero Hodge. I think he's he's certainly making a name for himself. Um, defensively, I was I was a bit surprised by how the Falcons played this. It seemed like they wanted to change it up from last week. Now, to the Rams' credit, they were running some very unusual stuff, like Ben Skronik uh, being the fullback. He's a wide receiver. Uh, they basically used him as the fullback uh, throughout this game. That created a lot of problems and made the Falcons make a lot of mistakes. But they were asking Ben Skronik to block basically cornerbacks, um, and he did a great job of that. So that this was, I think, a very well-executed game plan from Sean McVay that forced the Falcons to play some heavier sets against basically what was like 11 and, and even maybe you know 10 personnel because... Uh, they were using wide receiver as a fullback for a lot of the game. Uh, very interesting situation there. Um, we also uh, saw the Falcons ba- early in the game, especially they played a ton of four two five. So four down linemen. Um, you know, this is a team that has played more three four looks over the years. I think they were trying to get maybe more coverage out there. Obviously, the Rams are one, are a team that plays you know, more 11 than pretty much anyone else. So it's not surprising the Falcons were in nickel basically the entire game, but um, didn't really see a lot of, of you know, the three, four looks in this game until later. Um, the Falcons also played a lot of zone, especially early, and the Rams just destroyed it. They carved it up. Uh, it was not effective. The Falcons used Eric Harris as their slot corner, their slot defender, which was an interesting choice. Um it seems like they wanted uh, someone bigger, like some a bigger presence there, pro- probably to help against the run, you know, with, with the, the Rams playing this like weird fullback set with a wide receiver and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure that that really helped them at all with having Eric Harris there. I, mean, I don't think he played like poorly or anything, but the, the Rams were able to get Harris matched up on Cooper Cup a lot. That was obviously not a great setup. Um, so it uh, just didn't, I didn't really get that. Um, they did play D. Alford a little bit. They played Mike Ford a little bit, but I think just if you're going to play nickel, you know, just play your your slot corner. You know, maybe if Isaiah Oliver was healthy, we wouldn't be having this discussion. I imagine we wouldn't. Um, there was a lot of rotation of linebackers and safeties that I wasn't. I, I don't know if guys were getting hurt and coming back in. We haven't really gotten any information on that. But like Troy Anderson was playing linebacker for a while, um, really struggling against the run. Uh, you know, just getting wiped out of play plays. Um, you know, we saw Ray, uh, Rashawn Evans was taken out in favor of Troy. Um, so just odd situations, right? Uh, Dean Marlowe came in late for Jalen Hawkins. Again, I don't know if Hawkins was hurt or if they just wanted to swap out Hawkins. But, I mean, I didn't really think Hawkins was making a lot of mistakes. Just they're they're tinkering with the defense. And, and um, you know, they the defense did tighten up late in this game. Um, in the second half, I believe they only allowed the, what, the, the 10 points in the second half or something like that or uh, only three points, you know, at, after a certain point. And the Falcons were able to close the gap. So a big part of that was the defense. The defense did get some takeaways. Casey Hayward had a great interception. Uh, Michael Walker had a great interception. We're going to break that play down for sure. Um, you know, we had the, uh, <clears throat> the the forced fumble by Darren Hall late. This is They're creating turnovers where they weren't really – do, having a lot of success doing that last year. So that is something um, that I was impressed with. They're, they were creating turnovers, creating opportunities for them to, to claw their way back into this game. That was a big part of it. Um, also, I wanted to shout out Abdullah Anderson, who was uh, active for this game 
uh, as a practice squad elevation. I suspect that he will be taking Matt Dickerson's spot on the roster sooner rather than later. I, I thought he provided actually good depth. I thought, you know, we saw him chasing Matt Stafford on some occasions, making some plays against the run. Um, you know, I don't think he's really a starter, but I think as, as they desperately need some people to rotate in that are going to at least provide something. And I think Anderson was, was doing that. So, um, props to him for that. Uh, I do appreciate his efforts there. Um, those are all my main notes just overall. Uh, I, for three quarters, right. The Falcons played pretty bad. Um, they, they got blown off the turf by this Rams team, which is sort of what many were expecting. Uh, they did really come back hard. Uh, they, they fought, they fought back. This team didn't quit at any point. Certainly. Um, they just didn't, it was sort of too little too late. They really needed a lot of luck and they got, ended up getting some, which is great. Um, they made some of their own luck with those turnovers. Uh, but ultimately it was just a little too much to ask for such, such a big comeback. Um, and it, it, it fell short, but uh, they do deserve, I think, recognition for pulling pulling off the comeback, bringing it within four points. You know, if Kuda doesn't miss that kick, it could, be, it could have been a completely different game at the end because the Rams don't take that safety. They have to punt. Um, and, you know, you, with their punter possibly being hurt at that point, you know, do we know what it would have looked like? What would have happened there? You know, could they have afforded... To, to take, they wouldn't have been able to take the safety. So it, it could have gone very differently there. Um, you know, we'll see it, it, Falcons only would have needed to field goal to tie instead of needing to score a touchdown that could change things. So, you know, it's a lot of what ifs, but um, certainly you feel a lot better losing a four point game to the defending Super Bowl champions than you do being down, you know, 28 to three comically uh, after halftime. So it fit the, the, the finish was a lot stronger uh, and, they were in a much better position and the the national look at the Falcons, I think is a lot more positive this week because of the fight they showed. So um, now they just need to start winning. <laughs> they just need to win these games. Then it's like completely, you're going to get really goodwill. Um, you know, there's only so much goodwill people can muster for a great comeback that doesn't win the game. So um, it's better than blowing a 16 point lead. Certainly uh, it's, it's better than getting blown off the turf entirely. Uh, they will have, they have a much better point differential. I believe they have their minus five in the point differential at zero and two, which is not bad at all. Um, you know, we did see the saints get sort of their, their butts kicked by the bucks this week. But um, you know, if these two teams end up being, you know, playoff contender, great teams, then maybe the Falcons aren't, as, as, you know, 0-2 bad as maybe people think. The big test, obviously, this week is going to be against the Seahawks, which we'll get to in a few days. Uh, still got to break this stuff down. But, um, yeah, that's where we are after week two. So let's get to some of these plays, guys. Again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, time for some clips. Uh, and let's break down some of these pivotal plays, positive and negative, from the, uh, the Falcons' week two loss to the Los Angeles Rams. All right, let's get to the first play we're going to break down here. This is a pivotal third and 11. This is the opening drive of the game. It is 740 remaining in the first quarter. Uh, third and 11 here for the Falcons after, unfortunately, a false start uh, knocked them back from a third and six. So making this a much more difficult third down. It's about to get a lot more difficult because of what happens here. We're going to see a protection mistake that I wanted to make clear here that this was not just like, a, oh, somebody whiffed. Like, no, no, this is a poor call here. Um, so let me pull up my little telestrator real quick here. Uh, and we will look at it in a second. So we've got the Rams are going to be showing five rushers here, right? Pretty obviously. Um, they've got the two edge rushers, two interior guys, and then they've got Bobby Wagner uh, lined up here in a very aggressive look. So the center, Drew Dahlman, should know, right? He should know. This is a, this might be a five man pressure. I need to make sure we have someone accounting for Bobby Wagner, who's going to be right here, uh, so that he doesn't just blow right to the quarterback. Um, 
But I don't think Drew Dahlman notices Bobby Wagner at all because Bobby Wagner on this play is going to go right through this gap and just take out Mariota with no resistance because uh, both we're going to get two guys blocking the same player here. The whole line is going to sort of shift to the right. So we're going to see Elijah Wilkinson and Drew Dahlman sort of double team Greg Gaines here. We're going to see, uh, I believe, Lindstrom just pick up Aaron Donald, and then we're going to see McGarry kick out for, I think that's Leonard Floyd on the end, and then Jake Matthews is going to get his guy. I can't see the number, but the, the edge rusher on the left side. Um, we're going to have Dahlman calling a double team here when there's an extra rusher coming, and of course, as you will see, it's just going to lead to Bobby Wagner being completely untouched for a sack here on Marcus Mariota. Boom. Yeah, so you'll, as you can see on this one, um, right off the bat, we see these two guys both going towards uh, the, the, the nose tackle, Greg Gaines. Both Wilkinson and Dahlman are going to be taking this guy out. Jake Matthews is getting his guy. You can see he's looking towards his edge rusher. And Bobby Wagner's like, oh, wow, this is going to be really easy. I'm just going to go right to the quarterback. And that's exactly what happens, unfortunately. Um, just like like Wilkinson wasn't even looking for him um, because that was the protection call. They were going to slide over and double team the nose. Um, so that's just a blown, a blown coverage call by most likely the center. I mean, I, I don't know if Mariota was the one calling that or if it was the center. Typically, that would be handled by the center. So just a big mistake there that led to the Falcons' first red zone failure of the day. All right, second play we're going to talk about is at 934 in the second quarter. The Rams are already up seven. Uh, they're on first and goal here. We're going to see Los Angeles line up here with uh, Tyler Higby as the tight end. They're also going to have... Three receivers, which, of course, makes this 11 personnel uh, with the running back back there. Uh, interestingly, they're going to have what I mentioned before, right? We're going to see Ben Skoranek, the wide receiver, as the fullback here. Um, and basically, we're just going to see a complete and total domination on this play by the Rams. Every single Falcons defender is going to lose. They're going to get uh, blocked out of the play. No one's going to be able to shed their block, and that's going to lead to Daryl Henderson, the running back, just taking this straight up for an easy touchdown. Um, we're going to watch how this unfolds. The only one that really has a legitimate shot at it is Grady Jarrett, who has one arm to make a tackle. Uh, everyone else gets annihilated on this play. So, let's see. How it happens. We're just going to see the handoff here. And then just Henderson goes through a, a wide open gulf of people here. Um, so we're, this is just very, I mean, it's very well executed by the Rams, you know, props to them. Um, but just look at the domination. Uh, going to see Eba Katie taken out by Higby, just completely neutralized. You're going to see uh, Havenstein, the right tackle, take out Troy Anderson, who can't get off his block. The only one who has a chance here is Grady Jarrett in the middle. He's going to have one arm. <laughs> but you see Skaronic, the wide receiver, taking out Eric Harris, the safety. See number 73 taking out uh, the other linebacker. Um, you know, Lorenzo Carter's basically blocked out of the play over here. Uh, and we're going to see Cooper Cup take out Jalen Hawkins, as well, uh, and it's just completely easy money here, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, that's what it looks like uh, when you when every single offensive player hits their block and every single defensive player fails to get off their block. It's just easy touchdown for the offense. Um, now, you know, is this something that's going to happen all the time? Probably not. But you you would like to see your edge rusher and Ebikady, you know, get off the block from a tight end. Uh, you, would, you would probably need him to do that consistently. Um, you'd like to see your safeties not getting annihilated by wide receiver blocks all the time. Um, and you'd like to see your linebackers being able to shed as well. Uh, so in this scenario, every single player loses except for Grady Jarrett, but even he can't really impact the play because he's getting blocked uh, and, and the, the hole opens right next to him. He just can't get a hand on Henderson. Um, 
And there you go. The Rams are up 14. All right, folks. Here's another example of the Rams just really giving the Falcons defense fits by lining up their wide receivers in the backfield. Uh, we're going to see Cooper Cup lined up next to Matt Stafford, which should be an immediate red flag. And even the broadcast will call attention to this, like that that's an immediate red flag. You should expect something going on there. Um, and, you know, I'm not entirely sure what what the error is here. What we're going to see is Cooper Cup's just going to run out here be completely wide open, basically catch a pass, and then just walk into the end zone um, because no one's covering his area, no one's covering his zone. We're going to see uh, A.J. Terrell sort of like match up uh, on, I think that's Higby, the tight end. Um, you know, they're going to sort of go to this area of the field here right about the first down marker uh, and get caught up. And Michael Walker is just going to sort of run into them um, and just stay there. Uh, I don't know if Terrell was supposed to have the outside and he didn't go over there because he was so focused on on Higby, like he's playing more of a man coverage. It looks like everywhere else this is zone, so it could be that's a mistake. It could be some sort of other situation. But uh, somebody makes a mistake here because they leave com- Cooper co- completely uncovered and it forces you know Jalen Hawkins to try to run over here and make a play, which he does not. Um, And then it's an easy touchdown as Cup walks in pretty much untouched. Um, So let's see how this one plays out. So Cup's just going to run this really easy route, right? Catch the pass uh, and be contacted like once right before he walks into the end zone. Um, So I'm trying to figure out and I don't, you know, I won't know for sure who's supposed to have cup out of the backfield. Now, when someone's lined up in the backfield like that, if it's man, you know, typically a linebacker or a safety would take the running back, you know, if he's considered a running back, but I'm not sure that it is man based on how everyone else plays this, you know, like you have Grady Jarrett dropping here. So that implies sort of at least underneath zone coverage here. You have Hayward playing zone over here and it looks like the offered drops in some sort of zone here as well. So I don't know if Terrell has the wrong coverage in mind because he sort of just locks up his guy. Um, maybe it's it's also possible Terrell has his own responsibility on the play because he's AJ Terrell. So he might be like, hey, Terrell, lock up uh, Higby, make sure he doesn't get the first down. Um, you know, so I think it's probably Walker's responsibility to get the quote unquote running back and shut down this sort of dump off pass to Cooper Cup. But instead... Walker just sort of gets caught in the trash here. Like, not it's not even a rub route. He just sort of, like, stops here. Like, he's just here. He doesn't walk away or, or like, try to get around the play. He just sort of, like, stops there. Um, so I somebody made a mistake. I'm not sure who exactly it was. But that led to the easy touchdown for Cooper Cup. I, I sort of think it was probably Walker that was supposed to be picking up the running back out of the backfield. But... If it is zone and Terrell's playing, you know, what looks like maybe man on Higby there, then it wouldn't shock me if, like, Terrell's supposed to have that zone over there because he's the outside corner. Um, So it's just, it's confusing, but it's just a a lapse in coverage that leads to an easy touchdown and that uh, dreaded score number that I will not repeat here. All right, folks, we're going to fast forward a bit to later in the game. Third quarter, 6.35 to go. Rams have second and seven up, unfortunately, of course, 28 to three. Uh, The Falcons very down in the dumps here, but they're going to make a great play because Michael Walker is going to end up picking this off with a pretty devious coverage design here from Dean Pease. Um, The Falcons are actually going to be running man coverage here, uh, which for those of you that don't know, uh, you're going to watch, you're going to see Casey Hayward, the corner, follow his man across the field. That's a a telltale sign that you have man coverage. Um, So you're going to see Hayward run across the field. Uh, You're also going to see the most interesting thing that happens here, which is that the linebackers, both Rayshon Evans and Michael Walker, are sort of going to creep up like they're playing the run or pressuring, um, but then they're going to bail out of it. I believe there's actually a mistake here by Rayshon Evans, who I think is supposed to have the running back in man coverage, right? He's supposed to, I think, uh, go pick up Daryl Henderson, who's going to run out here and actually be open, like wide open on this play. But that doesn't matter because 
we have Michael Walker, who's also going to creep up and then drop back in this little zone here because the Falcons know that Matt Stafford wants to throw this pass to Cooper Cup very badly. Cup's just going to run in behind here. Uh, he's going to have Mike Ford getting him in man coverage here. Mike Ford's going to get beat on the play. Cooper Cup will appear to be open, but Michael Walker will be lurking right there waiting. So let's see what happens here. Like I said, you're going to see Hayward follow his man. You're going to see the linebackers jump up and boom. Matt Stafford throws it right into the hands of Michael Walker on this one. As he is fooled into thinking that Cooper Cup is open. Again, I really wish Game Pass uh, NFL Plus, whatever the heck they're going to call it these days. I wish they would actually put the L22 up in a timely manner, but they don't, so I can't wait for it. So, yeah, Stafford's just never going to see Michael Walker on this play. Um, he sees him come up towards the line. He just thinks he's out of the play. He sees the cornerback trailing behind Cooper Cup uh, and doesn't notice Walker dropping back, just waiting for him to throw that pass. It's an easy pick there for Michael Walker and a successful play for the Falcons defense as this is actually sort of the start of the comeback. So, all right, folks, we can't just have negativity here on the Falcoholic podcast. Let's take a look at Drake London's first NFL touchdown pass. Uh, very well-designed play here by Arthur Smith. We're going to get a nicely done uh, rub route by Kyle Pitts here. Um, that's going to free up just enough space for London to get this sort of easy slant uh, pitch and catch from Marcus Mariota. So we're going to see Kyle Pitts here. Uh, for those uh, listening, this is third quarter, 326 left in the quarter, second and goal here, Falcons down 3-28. to uh, Pitts is just going to go upfield uh, here for what looks like it could be like a fade route or a curl route or something over uh, there, which is obviously going to demand a lot of attention from the Rams secondary. And then behind or in front of that, I guess, depending... Uh, London is just going to creep in here on the slant, catch the pass right in front of his defender, and then just walk right into the end zone before anyone can make, uh, can do anything about it, really. So, let's watch this play in action. Mariota takes the snap here. We're going to see Kyle Pitts run up field, uh, and... It's easy money for Drake London, who makes the contested catch. He does have the defender pretty much right on top of him as this ball's coming in. Um, but no chance for Nick Scott. Uh, Drake London with his first NFL touchdown. Pretty simple play. Uh, nicely done route there by Pitts, who sort of... Look, Pitts is going to demand that much attention. They can't afford to sort of break off of that route or the ball is probably going to pit. So uh, just smartly executed. Obviously, I know fans would like to see a play like that go to pits sometime. Um, I would also like to see that, but uh, props where props is due. Well executed play, well drawn up, and London gets his first NFL touchdown. All right, folks, comeback touchdown part two. This is fourth quarter, 823 remaining in the game. Falcons facing second and six from the 11 yard line of the Rams. Uh, it's 31 to 10. Still, none of us are really thinking that this is, you know, close to happening or anything of the sort, but, uh, still hoping for some nice things from the Falcons offense, but we're going to see a pretty nice play executed here by the Falcons. Um, especially along with Zacchaeus. Uh, here's Zacchaeus on the end. He's just going to run right to about the, the first down line and sort of sit down in this zone. Um, and they refer to this as an option route on the broadcast. It very well may be. Um, but basically, Pitts is going to look at the coverage around him, um, look at what's going on with Marcus Mariota, and he's just going to sort of get more space, go to the sideline, catch the pass, and then walk into the end zone up here. Um, so just a well-executed play. By Zacchaeus finding that sort of opening in the zone, um, knowing that he's not getting a lot of the attention, obviously, with Kyle Pitts on the field here, um, and is able to just take this in uh, for an easy touchdown. Um, good adjustment 
to the open space in the zone. Mariota sees it, and it's a touchdown. So let's watch this unfold here. So we're going to see Zacchaeus go up. He's just going to sit down. He notices the coverage, uh, moves out, is able to just get enough separation on Ramsey and the rest of that secondary, and he waltzes into the end zone untouched. Nice play by Zacchaeus. Good job by Mariota. Noticing that he was open there in the zone, getting the ball to him quickly uh, before Ramsey had time to recover. And the Falcons end up uh, closing the gap a bit here late in the game. All right, let's get to the next most pivotal play of the game. The blocked punt by rookie linebacker Troy Anderson. Um, I wish we had better angles of this play. Like I said, uh, NFL Plus is very unreliable when they put the game up. Now, also, this was a later game, so it's going to come up later. So this week is especially hard, so I don't want to, you know, bury him too much because this was a 4 o'clock, you know, to 7 o'clock game and not a 1 o'clock game, so that's also probably part of it. But um, basically, Troy Anderson is right here. Um, Lorenzo Carter is their other interior guy. Both guys are just going to, you know, try to get right past the long snapper. Troy Anderson, however, will succeed. He'll just go right through, go right to the kicker, go right for the ball, block it right there. Um, and then we're actually going to see Carter, the other guy, come around, scoop it up, and take it uh, for the fumble recovery touchdown. Just look at the speed of Troy Anderson here as he closes on this punt. Just completely unblocked, but still, he's there in an instant. I mean, the punter doesn't even have a chance. Like, it, I mean, he's there before the ball's even off the ground. Like, um, just phenomenal work there. Uh, really key... Really good block executed here by Eric uh, Eric Harris, by the way, uh, to make sure that this gets into the end zone because the Falcons don't have a lot of time to waste. Um, and there you go. Uh, the Falcons close the gap within a touchdown uh, before this two-point conversion, obviously. But um, excellent play by the rookie Troy Anderson. That pick already paying dividends uh, on special teams with an absolutely crucial blocked punt. It didn't end up changing the game, um, but it would have been impossible for this to have to have even been close without this play by Troy Anderson and Lorenzo Carter. So big props to the rookie props to the special teams for making that happen um, because they put this team in a position where they did absolutely have a chance to pull off an amazing comeback and they deserve uh, the props for that. All right, guys, last play, uh, a play that I view as a pretty critical mistake here for the Falcons and their chances of, of winning this game. Um, this designed quarterback run on second and nine late in the fourth quarter with the Falcons down just 25 to 31. I don't like the play call. I hate running on second and nine ever. Um, the Falcons were not having any success on the ground in this game really to, to write home about. So I don't like it from that angle. Even Mariota who scrambled very well uh, against the Saints, not really finding any success here. The Rams are all over this play from the very beginning. It certainly doesn't help that the Falcons completely blow most of their blocks. It doesn't help that Keith Smith plays this like he's going out to catch a pass and not and doesn't block his man, like just lets his guy go, and that's the guy who ends up sacking Mariota. Um, multiple guys miss their blocks. We see the right side of the line. We see a double team um, from Caleb McGarry and Chris Lindstrom while the a blitzer just goes around them and is getting basically a free run at the quarterback as well. So just a, the, the play was executed very poorly. That's sort of separate, but I just really hate the second and nine run call. Um, I just hate running on second and long analytics tells you it's a really bad call. It's very unlikely to generate a first down. Um, and if you're not going for a first down, I don't know what you're doing. Like playing for third and short is very stupid. Um, especially considering how poor this team was on third and short. Like it's not even like getting to third and short doesn't even help you that much, uh, especially for the Falcons in this game. So um, let's watch the, the comedy of errors on this play first. Um, there's so much going on, but right off the snap, like you'll notice a few things, right? You'll see Chris Lindstrom and Caleb McGarry are going to be double teaming the edge rusher on this side, leaving the cornerback who's blitzing completely free. Uh, you're going to see Greg Gaines here just completely blow past uh, his blocker in the middle. Um, he's going to go straight for Cordell Patterson, which I'm sure is his responsibility on the play. Um, thankfully, Cordell Patterson is not getting the ball here, so that doesn't necessarily blow it up. But you do see, you know, Drew Dahlman and Elijah Wilkinson basically completely whiff. Um, on 
<laughs> Greg Gaines here. Uh, Dr- Jake Matthews is holding up against his guy. But we're also going to see Keith Smith basically start to block his man and then just run out like he's going to catch a pass. Um, and then his guy is just going to go and actually be the guy who takes out Mariota. So a lot of mistakes on this play. Um, you know, it just... I, it just was very poorly executed, and I just hate the play call. So that's just a double whammy for me. Um, like, I, I the, nobody was on the same page. They missed an obvious blitz. I mean, this guy's creeping down, you know, already. I, I, I mean, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to call, but um, nobody's out there looking for that extra blitzer. Guys whiff immediately uh, on, on their blocks, and Keith Smith looks like he's playing a different play than the Falcons. Um, and again, we've got Drake Lennon and Kyle Pitts running routes here for, to no avail. Um, like I, if you're going to have a design quarterback run, like, I don't know why those guys aren't blocking. Like, you know, I, I guess they're trying to sell that it's a pass or something like that, but like, like, why aren't they blocking anyone? Like, even if Mariota escapes, he's going to have to get past all these guys. Like, uh, I mean, you know, to, to be fair, like if Mariota does somehow get out of there, he's got a solid chance maybe of, of making it. But I mean, he has no chance because of course he's getting sacked. Uh, so hate the play, hate the play call, hate the missed execution. But uh, this was an absolutely crucial play that you had. You had to get something with this second and nine and running. Obviously, I dislike and running a play that gets blown up and that looks really sloppy and poorly executed by everyone. That's even worse. So uh, big thumbs down on that play call from me. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, a heroic comeback that falls short with a play that I don't really like at the end, unfortunately. But there were some good plays in there. Um, I admire the way the team fought back. I, I liked some of the special teams plays. I liked some of the turnovers that were forced. There were certainly some good things to take away from this game. So I, I, I hope that I covered a little bit of both in this one. Definitely leave this game feeling a little bit better little bit less sick to your stomach than the uh, the Saints game where you blow the lead. Um, so, uh, you know, I, going into this game with the Seahawks that we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot over the next week, um, Falcons should have a chance to win this. I think if they don't, their pitchforks are going to come out if they're not out already. Um, you know, because 0-3, the season's over, more or less. So, um, at least if they win against the Seahawks, they can keep our hopes alive for a little bit longer. Um but it, you know, as you can see, like the Falcons against a team as talented as the Rams just overmatched for much of the game. They, they of course, did uh, pull out some tricks late. They, they they managed to make it a game and they, they made it very close. I'm sure they made the Rams really sweat, which is nice to see the Falcons do that to someone for a change. But they fall short. Uh, they don't make the plays when it, when it really matters at the very end. The offense just can't quite get it done. Obviously, that missed field goal on the first drive comes back to haunt you. The fact that you basically got no offense at all in the first half ha- comes back to haunt you. Um, we have to do better. The Falcons have to do a lot better. Um, I don't really take issue schematically with like the overall game plan or anything like that. Like I did last week, you know, on that on that crucial drive um, that they played. You know, their whole entire reserve defensive line. There's nothing like that in this game. Um, definitely some interesting decisions with how they rotated guys. That I talked about at the top of the show, and um, I know people are pissed off about. Pitt's not getting targets and I get that. Um, but I think overall this was a fine, you know, game plan. Um, it didn't really go as planned obviously, but they rallied well. Um, they made some adjustments that I think gave the Rams some fits late and, and they were in a position where they could have beaten the defending Super Bowl champions on the road in week two. And, and that deserves some level of props, even if I'm not going to go out of my way to, uh, praise an 0 and two team here, but, um, certainly feel better about the direction than I did after week one. Um, and if they can pull off a victory in week three, you know, suddenly at one and two, you're not necessarily buried anymore. Now you still have to go out and win some of these next couple games. Like you probably need to beat the Browns to have a chance, you know, at at still being a team that's going to surprise people this year and that sort of thing, because then you got to go to Tampa Bay, you know, San Francisco, we'll see, are they better off with or without Jimmy Garoppolo with or without Trey Lance? You know, I don't know. Um, they certainly seem to be doing pretty well this week. Um, so there's, there's a lot of tough games on the schedule. The Falcons have a couple of easier ones here. Like I said, with the Seahawks, with the Browns. So this is where we need to see them. If they're going to do something, all you guys telling me they're going to surprise people and be this great, you know, not necessarily great, but better than people expect team. They need to do it against these lesser opponents. Um, so that they have a little bit of breathing room. Obviously I wouldn't be upset if they beat these good opponents too, but 
you know, one step at a time. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the Falcons Film Review for Week 2. We will be back on Wednesday for the next Falcoholic Live. That'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on our YouTube channel or on Thursday morning on the podcast. Of course, we'll have our game preview coming out Friday on the podcast uh, and on the YouTube channel as well. And of course, post game show on Sunday. We really do appreciate it. Like I said, leave a, leave a five-star review. If you enjoy, uh, like subscribe, hit the bell. If you're watching on YouTube and you enjoy as well, we do appreciate those metrics. And if you're so inclined, support us on Patreons, patreon.com slash Falcoholic Live. If you're an avid podcast listener, you hate ads, you want to get it early for your morning commute or for your, your, your night commute, you know, maybe you work nights. Uh, you should get these, Almost always the night before they come up on the podcast feed on the Patreon. That, that is patreon.com slash Falcoholic Live. All the all the uh, the tiers get access to that stuff. So um, thank you guys so much for your support, for tuning in. We will see you next time on the Falcoholic Live. Until then, talk to you later, folks.